Thank you everybody for joining us at the Tom Hughes Report. I want to thank his channel also for giving us the opportunity to be able to present to you uh, this program, that we will stay informed and encouraged. As we look at today's message, know that Bible prophecy, it, listen, it doesn't send you to your local convenience store with this week's winning lottery numbers. Instead, it lays out for us certain key pivot points in human history. One of the most important of these pivot points is the coming of Antichrist and his one world government. If you want to make sense of the crazy things that are happening right now in the world, you need to understand the basic things that the Bible tells us about Antichrist, his nature, the nature of his power, and the nature of this coming regime. Have you stopped to think about it? Listen, why is there so much crazy in the world going on right now? That's the perfect word to describe it when you look at what's taking place. Why do we live in a world that tells us that men can have babies if there is no such thing. And it also tells us that there's no such thing as men. There's no such thing as women. In fact, men and women can't even be defined anymore by people who lead our country right here in the United States of America. You add to this, all of these different things that we're looking at, the leader of the free world cannot even put together a coherent sentence. Why is it the cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles and New York are overridden with violence, homelessness, and all sorts of wickedness and insane activities? It's all about our proximity to Antichrist and the tribulation. Even while a giant hurricane is still out at sea, listen, it begins to influence weather patterns hundreds of miles away. Again, it's about proximity. The Antichrist has not been revealed, but our proximity to his rise is already causing a shift in the political patterns of most nations and the thought patterns of billions of individuals. It's crucial to understand that the Antichrist will not just be a political and governmental leader, his will also be a spiritual movement. He won't just win men's minds, but also their hearts, their souls, and spirits. His followers will follow him into hell, uh, but they are not inherently stupid. Their foolishness happens by choice. They enter a pattern of repeatedly rejecting truth, and that makes them increasingly vulnerable, gullible, and thoughtless. It is also crucial to know that even though the identity of Antichrist has not been revealed yet, the spiritual power that will animate him is already at work among us, and that is the power of Satan himself. On today's program, I'm going to cover some ground that I address in, in greater depth in my book, Marking the Masses. Uh, that book deals with Antichrist, his coming one world government, his mark, and his two partners in crime, the false prophet, and Satan himself. Uh, listen, the word Antichrist is actually found in only four verses of the Bible. All of them in letters from the Apostle John. One of the things those verses tells us is that the person we call Antichrist was already known by that name to the early church. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 says, Little children, in the last hour, uh, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Several English Bible translations, including the New King James Version, capitalized the word Antichrist when speaking of the one person foretold for centuries in ancient prophecy. Here, Antichrist is capitalized because it is used as a name. These translations do not capitalize Antichrist when speaking of the many who oppose Christ uh, in a more general sense. Listen, it's vital to understand that there were in those days, just as there are today, many antichrists. Uh, that is, there are many who oppose Christ and his work in the world. This verse uh, lets us know that a person need not lead a totalitarian one world government uh, to be an antichrist. To be antichrist is simply to be against Christ. Uh, the context of this verse shows that when it mentions many antichrists, it's specifically speaking of false teachers. A few verses later, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, uh, the Bible says, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. 
Already in the first century, there were those who pretended to embrace the teachings of Jesus, but denied the reality of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Today, such people rule many of the world's most prestigious Christian seminaries. But they're kind of been around a long time. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus tells us that he is the truth. He's, in fact, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So Jesus himself says, I am the truth. But they deny the truth. So they are antichrist. But by denying his true identity, they deny the faith. 1 John chapter 4, verse 3 says this, and to quote, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now already is in the world. The Antichrist himself has not been revealed, but the spirit of Antichrist is not only present in the world, it already rules the world. And if you want to know why people are acting out in such literally crazy ways, uh, know that the spiritual reality of Antichrist is already here and it is enormously powerful. So let's take a, a look at the, at the basic information regarding Antichrist, his mark and his power. Revelation chapter 13, verse 16 through 18 says, and I quote, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Who or what is the beast? We'll go through a few questions to define things so we can all get it. But the beast is synonymous with Antichrist. The book of Revelation never uses the word Antichrist. In fact, the book of Revelation refers to him as the beast. But there's no doubt that this is the same individual spoken of in both the Old and New Testament prophecies. And according to Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, the number of the beast is the number of a man. That tells us something crucial. The beast is not just a symbol uh, but a flesh and blood human male. Uh, the Bible depicts him as a head of government who becomes the totalitarian leader of the world. He will promise utopia, but his actions will trigger a time of unprecedented disaster. Uh, in fact, folks, when we look at these things in the understanding of the Bible, and we look at the events that are taking place in the world right now, what do we see? We see this constant call uh, for we need a leader. We look, the world does not have a good leader. And this man is going to come on the scene. And again, it is going to be an individual. And, and, and they're looking for a man. Somebody's going to be at the top of this. And there's going to be the false prophet too. And the world's going to be willing to give their allegiance to that person. And they're going to be required to receive his mark and to worship him. But things are going that way. But of the beast or of Antichrist, Daniel chapter 8, uh, verses 23 through 24 says, When the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. Uh, the New King James Bible uh, says it this way in Daniel chapter 8, beginning in verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features. I look at this from New King James and really being able to understand, hey, this is speaking of the latter days. And it, so it's projecting us still into the future. But again, we can see it coming about. He understands sinister schemes. In other words, he understands dark things, dark sentences, these demonic things. This is this man. Wow. Verse 24, his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Interesting, we'll get to that in a minute. He shall destroy fearfully and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Wow, destroy the holy people. That's a reference specifically to 
of the Jewish people, the people of Israel, uh, through prosperity, through peace, he's going to win people over to his side. But at first, when you look at this that we just read, it may sound self-contradictory to say his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. But Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, explains exactly what that means. The dragon, it tells us there, uh, gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, identifies the dragon as Satan himself. In fact, it says there in Revelation chapter 12, uh, as he's identified as the dragon, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. We see the same identification in Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. It again calls him that serpent of old, who is the devil and is Satan. That is why Daniel says the Antichrist power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. The dragon, that serpent of old, will directly empower the beast. In fact, I personally believe that uh, Antichrist himself will be possessed uh, by Satan himself. All right, so we understand who the first beast or Antichrist is. But next question, who is the second beast? Well, Revelation chapter 13, verse 11, the Bible says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. The first beast is Antichrist. The second beast is later identified as a false prophet. Uh, the pronoun he in Revelation 13, 16 refers to the Paul, false prophet when it says he causes all to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Uh, Revelation chapter 13, verses 12 through 18 describes the false prophet as both a propagandist for Antichrist and an enforcer of Antichrist rule. He deceives people into worshiping the first beast and he punishes them if they refuse. To understand the Antichrist, his mark, and his coming world government, we need to see those things in the context of other end time events such as the rapture. Uh, so let's go to the next question. What then is the rapture? Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verses 16, through 18 describes this event and to quote uh, the lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of god and the dead in christ will rise first then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the lord wow at hope for our times our mission is to spread the hope of jesus christ through the word of god your generous contributions enable us to create impactful videos and resources that offer hope during uncertain times. We invite you to partner with us in our mission. If you feel called to support us, please visit our website at hopeforourtimes.com where you'll find various ways to contribute financially. Additionally, donations can be sent by mail to Hope For Our Times, 1281 North State Street, Suite A, 311, San Jacinto, California, 92583. Your partnership directly fuels our efforts to develop new resources and connect with a wider audience. By partnering with us, you become an integral part of our mission to share the hope of Jesus Christ with a world in need. Now, let's return to the Tom Hughes Report. At the rapture, Jesus will snatch his people from the earth. The dead in Christ will rise first, immediately followed by those believers still living. Soon after the rapture, some of those left behind will begin to turn to Christ. But please don't think of this as plan B. Yes, people will come to Christ after the rapture, but it will be very difficult. It will cost them their lives. Uh, the favored way uh, to be executing them during that time will be to behead them so when you think of that i think man uh, people say well i don't really want to believe jesus right now if everything comes about like you say it's going to come about then i'll believe during the tribulation period listen it's going to be a lot easier to live for christ now than it will be to die for him during the tribulation period if you don't know the lord i encourage you uh, come to know 
the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, next question. Is the rapture really imminent? Uh, you may have heard the expression, the rapture's imminent. To a lot of people, this means the rapture is on the verge of happening. Uh, and, and since they heard the same thing 50 years ago, they assume it was not true and still isn't. But an imminent rapture does not mean it will happen in the next few minutes. Instead, it, it means that it could happen in the next few minutes, seconds or milliseconds. It also means it could happen 50 years from now. Uh, but it means there are no signs to be fulfilled before the rapture. The signs in the Bible about the second coming of Christ all have to do with the tribulation and his second coming. Think of it this way. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Jesus said, Watch therefore, for you do not know uh, what hour your Lord is coming. As we look at that, listen, we don't know what hour the rapture is going to take place. And we don't know when his second coming is going to be. We do know for those who are living during the tribulation period, however, that uh, at the time of the abomination of desolation, listen, it's going to be three and a half years, and then the second coming is going to take place. So we understand that. But at, at where we are right now, we don't know when the rapture is going to take place. We don't know when the confirmation of the covenant of Daniel chapter 9 is going to take place. And, and then also, uh, we don't know when the second coming of Christ at the end of the tribulation is going to take place. But we do know this, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 29 through 30, Jesus said that his second coming will be immediately after the tribulation of those days. From the start of the tribulation forward, we know to the day when Jesus will return, but quite frankly, I don't believe I'm going to be here. I believe I'm going to be caught up uh, before then at the time of the rapture. But according to Daniel chapter 9, it will be seven, the tribulation period will be seven, 360-day years after Antichrist confirms his covenant with the nation of Israel. Let me read a little bit of that to you uh, so we can connect all the dots and understand what it means regarding uh, the 70-week period. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's looking for an understanding to the visions and dreams that he has. And the angel tells him, and in verse 24 of Daniel chapter 29, Daniel, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Let me stop here just a minute. Um, 70 weeks are determined. Uh, we'll get into the definition of 70 weeks in a minute. But for the most part, they are 70 um, uh, weeks of prophecies, each week being a seven-year period. And it's divided up, as we'll see, into 483 years or 69 weeks already being fulfilled and seven weeks, the last, the 70th week of Daniel, yet to still be fulfilled. We'll see that in just a second. But he says 70 weeks are determined for your people, for your holy city. The word determined, it means it is settled. In other words, God has said it, it is going to happen. It's also determined, it's settled for your people, for your holy city, um, for the people of Jerusalem, that's the holy city, and the people is the Jewish people. What for? Uh, to finish the transgression, bring an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So bring an end to sin, bring in everlasting righteousness, and Jesus is going to come back. He's the anointed one. He's, the uh, most anointed one will be standing in, on the Mount of Olives, and then he's going to make his way and rule and reign from Jerusalem. But 70 weeks are determined. It is settled. It must happen for Jesus to come back. Does that make sense? That's why all of these events are taking place. It's preparing the world for the second coming of Christ. All right. A little bit more to go, not too much. Hang with me a little bit longer. Uh, so let's work through this prophecy. There are many signs of the second coming. The rapture is different. We do not know uh, its day or hour. That's why the Bible repeatedly says to be ever watching. We are not waiting for signs to be fulfilled. We are listening for a shout from heaven and the trumpet of God. All right. So with that, next question 
What is the tribulation? As I mentioned, just a little bit more. I know there's a lot here today, but this really helps us to be able to understand the time frame that we're in and also to be able to understand what the Bible does say when you hear these terms. So what is the tribulation? Well, like the rapture, we could spend hours on this topic, but here are the basics. After God takes the church out of the way, Antichrist will be able to take power. He will confirm a covenant between himself, Israel, and Israel's neighbors, and, and likely uh, many other world leaders. It literally says he will confirm a covenant with many. As I just mentioned, according to Daniel chapter 9, this action will start the clock on something called Daniel's 70th week, the final seven-year period. Looking again at Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, the angel Gabriel tells Daniel, 70 weeks are determined, are settled for your people in your holy city. So uh, again, in this, it's settled, it's going to happen. And the word translated weeks literally means sevens. Uh, try to understand this because this is really important to understand the prophecies of Daniel for those who say, no, these things are just allegory or, or they were already fulfilled they were not fulfilled. In fact, Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 even refers back to Daniel's prophecies and says they're coming in the future. But the context of this chapter shows uh, the sevens, the weeks, the sevens to be not groups of seven days, but of seven years. And following the calendars of that time, these years consist of 360 days each, not 365. Scripture features weeks of years at several places in the Old Testament. The prophecy speaks in uncanny detail about the 70 weeks of years. By comparing this prophecy with history, we know with certainty that 69 of the weeks, or 483 years, have already passed accurately fulfilled to the day. The prophecy showed that there would be a pause between the 69th week and the 70th week. In other words, the 483 years and the final seven years. There would be a pause. And there has to be a pause because in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, the Bible says that two things will happen after the end of the 69th week of years and before the 70th week starts. The first thing mentioned is that Messiah shall be cut off. Uh, that was fulfilled with the crucifixion of Jesus. The other thing mentioned is the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. That was fulfilled in 70 AD. From our human perspective, the pause between the 69th week and the 70th week has turned out to be an extremely long pause. The final seven years of the prophecy, Daniel's 70th week, have not yet begun. We commonly call those seven years the tribulation. During that time, Antichrist and the false prophets set up a system for taking complete control of the planet's commerce. The Bible calls their system the mark of the beast. Listen, think through this. We're in this time, I, I would call it a time of grace, from the time when Jesus was crucified, right up until now, and even up until the rapture, and, and then the beginning of the tribulation period, there's been this giant pause, but everything will happen again. And during the days of our pause right now, that we are witnessing, as I mentioned from the very beginning, the building of the infrastructure of that final seven-year kingdom of Antichrist that is coming. I hope that makes sense. But people who come to Christ after the rapture will refuse the mark of the beast. Uh, for that choice, they will face merciless persecution. But Jesus, he will bring it all to an end with his second coming. Again, Daniel chapter 9, an end to sin and transgression. And what else? Bring in everlasting righteousness. So how does the tribulation fit uh, the Bible's end time scenario? Well, after the pause described in Daniel chapter 9, as I mentioned, and when you come to verse 27, one of the Bible's most important prophecies, then he, Antichrist, will com confirm a covenant with many for one week, the, again, the years, right? But in the middle of the week, in the middle of the seven-year period, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Listen, the Bible presents two key triggers in this scenario. First, Israel confirms a covenant with Antichrist, and that covenant or agreement officially begins Daniel's 70th week. 
Uh, the second trigger comes in the middle of those seven years with the abomination of desolation that I mentioned. And that is when Antichrist uh, reneges on his covenant and desecrates the Holy of Holies in the temple. That force, the spirit of Antichrist is at work right now. That's why uh, there are Satan clubs in an increasing number of elementary schools across the nation. That's why small children are being taught to question whether or not they are boys or girls. They are taught to define male and female using totally bizarre spiritual criteria instead of common sense. That's why university students uh, across much of the world are marching in favor of baby butchering rapists in Gaza and that much of the world is denying it even happens, even though we know it happened. He at least has the wisdom to know his time is short. Uh, we need to understand uh, that also about ourselves and our time. Folks, if the devil knows his time is short and he's got to do something about it to protect himself, he wants to usurp the authority of God. It's not going to work. Folks, we need to recognize that our time is short. Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 9, verse 4, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. That applies to all of us. Listen, I encourage you. Again, I want to note this. If the devil knows his time is short, recognize for you and me, our time is short. Let's be about our Father's business. Let's tell other people about the hope of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, we do these messages here at the Tom Hughes Report and not so we would be afraid, but so we would get it. We'd have the aha moments. We'd be able to connect the dots. We would understand what the Bible says. So our faith would grow and our fears would be diminished. And we would say, wait, my days are numbered. The psalmist told me to number my days. Lord, help me to be about your business, not to be locked in fear, not to ignore everything, but to be in your word and tell others about the hope that is in here. And know this, Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 21, verse 28, when you see all these things begin to take place, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. Folks, all these things are beginning to take place. We're living through the time of the building of the infrastructure for the kingdom of Antichrist. But you want to know what? Jesus is coming and he is going to bring in the new world order, the millennial kingdom, where he rules and reigns from Jerusalem and we will be with him. God bless you guys. See you next time. Thank you for tuning in to the Tom Hughes Report. We pray today's program was a blessing to you. Here at Hope For Our Times, our purpose is to guide individuals towards the hope that can only be found in a personal relationship with Jesus. We encourage you to explore our website at hopeforourtimes.com and reach out to us through the contact page. We value your feedback and would love to hear from you. A special thank you to his channel for graciously allowing us to utilize their wonderful studios for recording the Tom Hughes Report. Don't forget to explore their website at hischannel.com for an array of Christ-centered programs. Make sure to join us again next week for another insightful episode of the Tom Hughes Report. And always remember to look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near.